What does your clothing say about you? Maybe you wear a t-shirt from your favorite sports team. Maybe you wear certain clothing as part of your religious practices. Well, if you were a Seattle woman fighting for your right to vote in the early 1900s, your clothes might have said a lot about your politics. Starting in the 1850s, American women's clothing began to be more restrictive and bulky. In response, the bloomer was invented as an alternative. This outfit consisted of loose, baggy trousers gathered at the heel under a skirt that reached the knees. Although the bloomer was not initially created for the cause of women's suffrage, it became linked to the movement because women's rights activist Amelia Bloomer promoted them. Prominent suffragists like Elizabeth Cady Stanton liked how the bloomer was much less constricting compared to regular women's dresses. Many people, but especially men, ridiculed the women who wore bloomers because they feared the breakdown of traditional gender roles. They linked women wearing clothes that looked like men's clothes to women acting like men. Women who wore bloomers in public were so heavily mocked that even Amelia Bloomer herself stopped wearing them because it was distracting people from their work to get women the vote. The lesson of the bloomers taught later suffragists that pushing for radical change could alienate potential supporters. When the fight for women's suffrage in Washington reignited in 1906, prominent suffragists, including Catherine Smith, Emma DeVoe, and May Arkwright Hutton, promoted a method called the still hunt. The still hunt focused on quietly convincing men to vote for women's suffrage. They insisted that women voting would not change gender roles, but would instead make women better wives and mothers. Suffragists faced a lot of prejudice and misconceptions. Anti-suffragists claimed that women who wanted to vote were bitter spinsters, immoral women, or women who wanted to act like men. In order to soothe these fears, Seattle suffragists were very careful about projecting a certain image. They had to be fashionable, but not dowdy, modest, and above all, feminine. This communicated the message that these women fit into polite feminine society. Catherine Smith, the leader of the Alki Suffrage Club, was a master at striking this balance and was often praised by the press for her fashionable outfits and hats. Suffragists used accessories such as buttons, sashes, pennants, and ribbons to communicate their support of suffrage. This type of visibility also communicated strength in numbers and showed a united front. Washington Magazine, Votes for Women, stated that buttons were a way for even the shyest supporter of suffrage to show their support. Mass production meant that by the early 1900s, suffrage memorabilia could be produced cheaply and in great numbers. Suffragists took advantage of this and used accessories to create a brand for the movement. Washington suffragists used yellow, white, and green as their colors. The green was a reference to Washington's nickname as the Evergreen State. Another suffrage symbol added the number of stars to a flag when a new state passed women's suffrage. A popular button from the time showed the phrase, votes for women, surrounded by four stars representing Wyoming, Utah, Colorado, and Idaho. Washington would become the fifth star when it passed women's suffrage in 1910. Washington suffragists, including Catherine Smith, organized a Women's Suffrage Day at the Seattle World's Fair in 1909. Suffragists decorated the grounds with green Votes for Women banners and handed out green suffrage ribbons and pins for supporters to wear. Washington women won the right to vote in November 1910. Although fashion was not the only tactic Seattle women used to win the vote, it was an important factor. Votes for Women magazine cited visibility of the movement as a key factor to the campaign's success in Washington. Some women probably resented the narrow range of accepted dress that they could wear in order to be taken seriously. Fashion, however, was also a uniquely feminine tactic that was cleverly used by suffragists to gain voting rights. Thank you for watching. As a nonprofit, everything we do is funded by our generous donors and members. If you want to help us preserve our history, please consider donating or becoming a member through our website.